Welcome to Bigfoot Notes from the Field. I'm your host, William Jevning. Uh, what I thought we'd do this week is we're going to have a roundtable discussion. We have, uh, and I, I don't know if you want to want to use your name or should we just call you Jack? Yeah, go ahead. Call me Jack. Okay, we have Jack. We have uh, our regional director for the Northwest, Milo Rogers, and Joe DeHoyos, our Southwestern regional director. Uh, what we're going to talk about this week is uh, deals with sort of um, uh, Sasquatch predatory type behaviors. And I, I think it's interesting because a lot of people out there get confused about these things. You know, they think they're just sort of uh, these big bumbling things that we should have seen if they were out there because they just kind of wander aimlessly around the forest. And really, that's the farthest from the truth. Uh, if you look at it in the context, and largely because of the large volume of food it requires uh, on a daily basis to make these things survive, <clears throat> and it's it's at least a 15,000 calorie a day plus diet. So, uh, you know, meat as a food source is one going to be one of their top uh, pursuits. So, I guess. Uh, Jack, now you had, uh, or I guess, I don't know, we, we're just kind of starting. Now, you sent, you sent me a picture, and that was a yeah. goat. Uh, tell us about, what, what did you find out about that particular item? Well, I, you know, after, after several questions talking to the, to the owner, the lady that owns the property, they've been having some off and on issues for the past couple of years. The one thing that, <clears throat> that she couldn't ever answer definitively. I'm like, look, do you find fang marks in the back of the neck? Because I'm trying to eliminate Bigfoot as the, the source. You know, possibly could be a mountain lion, could be a, a jaguar that, that come up out of uh, Mexico. Uh, you know, could be a bobcat, but I couldn't see a bobcat just ripping off a limb like that uh, and dragging it the way it did. Because, uh, you know, that goat looked like it was a pretty good-sized goat. Right, and she could never tell me. You know, she said she didn't find any fang marks. She did find claw marks on one, and uh, they've lost several goats and sheep over the past couple of years. And and I said, is it? Do you, do you lose one like once every thirty to forty five days? Which would be that'd be on par with a mountain lion, because they're they're uh, they're uh, they're they're more of a uh, they're not a sedentary animal. They're uh, they're they're more of a roaming animal. They uh, they don't do uh, they don't do stationary real well. Yeah, uh, it's not it's not some place they'll focus on and go over and over again. Exactly. Um, and uh, she said no. It's she said there'd been a couple of times where there'd been like three or four goats over three or four days, and then it stops and and. Uh, and then it'll pick back up again. They found some that were slung in trees. Uh, in trees. In trees. Now I'd, I'd done some some uh, some background research on that area, and they're over in Pioneer, Texas. And uh, some of the issue that that Pioneer's kind of brush country. It's not uh, it's not real heavily wooded, but there's a lot of rivers in the area. So, and it's, and it's hilly. So they, they've got, they got terrain features to hide, but, uh, you know, like I told her, I said, well, if you got, if it is a mountain lion and it's, and it happens to be taking your livestock this way, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, cause I got a three-year-old kid. I said, I wouldn't leave my kid outside by itself. Right. Now let me, for the folks listening, uh, who aren't familiar with Texas, is that in Eastern Texas, West Texas? It's more central, central West Texas. Central, okay. It, so it's how a, many, how many goats did they have missing total? Uh, about twenty-five. That's a big number, and that's, that's a lot more than I think a cat's going to take. Well, you know, over you know, a couple year time frame, that would be way more than a than a, a mountain lion would take. Right. Uh, mountain lions have the tendency they'll. They'll make a kill and then they they drag the kill into the brush, and hide the the carcass so that way they can eat in peace. Right, right. Now, Joe, have you seen this picture? No, I haven't seen it yet. No. Uh, yeah, for some reason I don't 
I don't have your number in my phone. Otherwise, I just sent Milo uh, a text with the picture. Um, and I, I don't know, Jack, if you have Joe's number, you could maybe send a text of that picture I, to him. I got it someplace, but I can probably send it to him via Facebook. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've got it. Okay, I'll, have to, I'll send a picture to you later, Joe. Um, okay. It's, Milo, what do you make of it? You know, I'm me being uh, not a real outdoorsy kind of guy like that, you know, I mean, to me, that's just bizarre. So, I mean, I look at it from from just a hiking standpoint. It's like, man, if I ever come across something like that, I'd be freaked out. And, and you know, it's interesting is uh, when you look at the picture, um, let me get it up here. You know, it's not just something with its throat torn out, which in this case it is. Right, yeah. But you can see the upper uh, left, probably quarter, nearly a quarter of the animal uh, is removed. The meat's removed right down to the ribs. Uh, a large chunk of the throat, not just something uh, like a cat would bite out. I mean, a huge portion of the throat is gone, and the left front leg is not only missing, but you can see it in the picture back a few yards now you can see the animal's been dragged because of the blood trail in the grass for, for right. quite a ways it looks like yeah. but you know um, let me tell you there, there was a story I knew, I knew this old timer uh, when I lived in Vancouver back this would have been the early 90's uh, he described now, he was quite a character he used to he was a biker and he used to go poaching with his buddies uh, up in the mountains there and he said one time they were up there and this would have been back in the mid 70's they shot a deer they were spotlighting one night and it was on a switchback on the road above the one they were on. It was another portion of the road that just switched around going up the hill. Uh, they shot the deer. They knew it went down, so they went up to get it. And when they got to the where the deer fell, it was gone. They found blood and drag marks in the snow. Uh, as they followed the drag mark and blood trail in the snow, the light shined on this enormous creature dragging the dead deer away by its neck. And he says, well... You know, we weren't stupid. We decided to let it have the deer since it was a lot bigger than us and the Jeep. So um, it, it remi this picture reminds me quite a bit of that because it it's the same thing they described. So, right. I mean, and, and of course now in that part of Texas, I don't know what other animals would do something like that other than a cat. Well, you might see you might see a coyote or a, or a, a koi wolf do that, but... Uh, you know, you'd see more predation on, on the carcass than what we've seen. That's my thoughts, because you only see it in the one section of the animal, really. Um, none of the rest of the animal. I mean, the head's not really damaged that we can see. And we should probably post this on, on our Facebook page later on so people listening can uh, take a look for themselves. And, and uh, it's a pretty interesting picture. Well, if it was a coyote, wouldn't they go for the underbelly or exactly. anything? See, you'd see the, the entrails would be ripped out. Uh, yeah, this, it seems like it's some kind of pissed off, you know, I'm just going to show people what I can do kind of thing. I, well, that's you know, the way I took it. I, I'm like, man, that would really freak me out if I come across that. I'd be like loaning everything I got. <laughs> well, you know, that putts Young's. You know, he's such a wimp, he wouldn't even go out there and look at it. I don't know what the hell T.W.'s thinking. He's still pissed off about his ex-wife. Uh oh you know, let's get over that <laughs> shit. You know, but, you know, like I told you, he's like, I ain't going out there. What the hell if the damn thing's still there? And I'm like, you pussy, what the hell's the matter with you? Go out there and find out. I mean, that is remarkable. I mean, that, to me, is that's some strength right there just to rip that off like that. It is absolutely. Um, so, I mean, that's that would get my hair going. Well, no doubt. I mean, um, let me see. I'm trying to. I want to. I want to send this to Joe. Yeah, I got it. Oh, you I got, got it. it. Okay, I, good. I yeah. it him. So yeah. now, what do you, what do you think of it, Joe? Yeah, I mean, that's just like for me. It'd be like. Just sending a message, basically. Hey, you know, I can do this whenever I want to, basically. <laughs> you know. Oh yeah. 
Uh-huh. And again, it's one of those things, you know, like we were talking about. Um, and like you said, it's not even fed upon or anything, you know. Just yeah, not really. I mean, there, there's you know a big portion of the of the front left quarter missing. I mean, including the leg, and the leg is lying behind the animal a few yards back. But uh, you know, again, what does that? Most animals, uh, especially those that are just using their mouths as implements, you know, that that are four legged, you know, cats or or. Um, coyotes things like that are going to go for the softer parts the underbelly a lot of times the rear end i mean they might kill the animal in the throat but this it almost looks like it was skinned in this part here yeah i mean well, it's, it's the really skin interesting was, was tore away but you know because uh, i had asked the woman i said is it missing any uh soft tissue organs and of course, she didn't know what I was talking about, and I said, "Well, I'm talking about you know, like heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, right. spleen, pancreas, you know, that kind of stuff. If they're missing that, if it reached inside that cavity and started removing organs, then that would have me concerned." Yeah, exactly. And uh, let me cat, ask you though, cat would now. Do- the, did did she happen to mention anything similar to this with the other animals that were killed? All of them. Uh, uh, she said mostly what they've been finding is, you know, they notice that they're they're missing a goat or a sheep, and then they, you know, they'll find them months later where there's nothing left. Oh, just uh, the bones. Yeah, and you know, it doesn't take very long in in, in Texas heat for a body to decompose. But, uh, you know, she said this one happened around about nine nine thirty in the morning, uh, oh, because wow. she, matter of fact, she went out there and fed the goats. And that very goat was there uh, and was eating and very healthy. And then she went to town and, and come back, and there's the goat, you know, not very far from their house. And it looks like it was drugged from where the where the uh, turnout pin was for the goats. Have, so, they, uh, have they suspected any? I mean, they must have some thoughts about what may well, or may not I have done it. Well, they're thinking it's a big cat, and you know you got to you got to tiptoe around these kind of subjects. You know, you know, kind of kind of light footed. You can't just go in there and say, "Well, you know, it's a Sasquatch," because you sure. know, first thing they're going to do is they're going to blast you with the big C and tape it right to your forehead. <laughs> right, right. But, <clears throat> you know, that's why you know. And I said, "Well, it could be it could be a big cat, or it could be something else." And she said, well, what else do you think it is? And I said, well, nothing that I would that I would broadcast openly on your on your Facebook page. But I did tell her, I said, uh, you need to really start looking for some some other signs. Um, and they did find some some mountain lion tracks, but they have it here in the, in the recent past eight or nine months. Mm hmm. Uh, and they didn't find any next to the carcass. So, you know, that's that's hard-packed soil. Yeah, it's, it's pretty of, tough to find any sort of any sort of animal sign when it's hard-packed. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and they hadn't had much rain in, in several months. So, uh, you know, when it gets hard-packed like that, you're not going to find much. Hey, can I? Now, do you, yeah, I'm sorry. Well. Hey, well, here's what I I didn't notice. I mean, the thing that looks really bizarre is there's no blood soak area. It looked like it was like killed somewhere else and then dragged off. You're right. You can see that it's been dragged to this location. But you know, I mean, if something just freshly killed, I don't well, know. you know, Milo, if you look yeah. at you look at behind the the goat, you can see yeah. the blood trail. I see that, but I mean, where it's laying now, wouldn't there still be blood coming out of it? I mean, not out of it like pumping, but I mean, soaking or just yeah, you'd see you'd see a a definite uh, a, you know a, a, a definite pool or where a blood pool was. Yeah, you, right. you it, even it, see it start hmm. to coagulate, and, and you don't even see that. You just see a you see so, a like a smear yeah. mark along the ground. So it's yeah, it looks likely- like it. I'm it sorry. Looks like it bled out. So it looks like it bled out earlier. Yeah. Or or if everything was taken out earlier somewhere else. I don't know. That's just. I mean, that is really wicked. 
Well, and it's like I told her. I said, you just need to be careful. I wouldn't let your kids go out by themselves. Yeah. You know, and especially in, in you know, uh, Central West Texas. You just don't let your kids go out by themselves. You don't know. They may run into a rattlesnake and, and get bit. But Oh, absolutely. Uh, but <clears throat> this is a big cat. She's got a three-year-old. I told her. I said, if it's a big cat. I would not let your kid go out by themselves. That's the right Absolutely. Time. Big cat to attack. Yeah. I mean, right now we got bears coming down to eat them claws. So that's crazy. Yeah, I especially I think too with, uh, you know, weather conditions they were with this year being kind of dry in most places. Uh, a lot of these animals are going to come down a little bit closer to people. Uh, that's even happening in this area. Well, I mean, you can look at the ground around that goat. You just don't see, you don't see hardly much. There's a, there's a, no, you, know, you don't. A little bit of grass, uh, and it looks like that the you know that they rotate their goat and sheep herd, so it keeps it pretty well mowed down as far as weeds and stuff go. But uh, you know, God, yeah, and you know, in that kind of ground, you're not going to see a whole lot of sign. Huh. But that to me that looks like that damn that whole that whole forelimb was just ripped off. It wasn't. Yeah. Oh yeah, you know it's it's uh, and you know and again that reminds me of you know hearing about you know deer and elk torn apart by these things. You know if in fact it was a Sasquatch, um, it makes me wonder too. Uh, you know why did it kill her and leave it? Although uh, for those listening, if you if you listen to the interview I did with Mike Clark on last week's show. Uh, Mike was, uh, he's involved in the whole skunk ape thing. Uh, if he's still, if he's still with us when I interviewed Mike a few years ago, he was in very poor health at the time. And I don't, I don't know if he's still alive or not, but, uh, he told me about some things in, and I want to say it was, I, I think South Carolina, maybe North Carolina in, gosh, I want to say it was the late seventies, but I don't recall if it could have been the eighties sometime. Uh, there was a whole series of animals, uh, you know, livestock and other animals that were killed. And they knew it was one of these things because of, of the conditions there. There was, it was muddier and they were able to see tracks. But the thing would go, come down and it would, it would bite animals in the back of their neck and break their, their spine. <laughs> and it would kill them, but it wouldn't eat them. Uh, sometimes it would mangle them, uh, you know, and do things like the, what's in this picture. Uh, almost of, as if it was being spiteful for some reason, you know. It would leave them where people they knew, like almost like it knew where people would find them. Uh, so I mean, I don't know. That's that's not really part of a uh, uh, a predatory type behavior. I mean, killing an animal is eating it is obviously, but uh, that's another whole subject. <laughs> you know, there are behavioral aspects. <laughs> if they're if they're going to be spiteful, that's something else. But it is curious that uh, you know some of this animal appears to be eaten. Uh, the leg is in the picture that's removed, but the animal was left. Unless it, whatever killed it, intended to come back for it. Well, and that's, but she said it was like, you know, 300 yards from their house. Okay, so maybe maybe it was spooked off for some reason and was going to come back later. Maybe, but, you know, the thing is that, to me, that that looks intentional. Uh, a mountain lion yeah, it looks does. for the house. It, right. looked, it looked like a statement. You know, I mean, I'm not trying to read into it any more than that, but it's just bizarre for an animal just to leave that if they're like in the food, you know? Yeah, it's, it's very unusual. And, and again, you know, for those listening, it's really hard you know, to imagine this unless you see the picture. Uh, but we'll put the picture on our the JRG Bigfoot Research page on Facebook and uh, and you'll be able to see this and, uh, and know what we're talking about. So, Joe... Uh, uh, you were in the field recently and had some other uh, witnesses you've been talking to. So what's happening with you lately? Well, yeah, you know, uh, besides being in, in, in the field, I want to talk a little bit about this goat or, uh, real quick, too. Okay, um, sure. My, uh, I, I recently messaged about my cousin's property in a certain county here in Texas. I don't want to give away the county. And uh, I was asking him if you could check into that see if uh, your friend knew any information on that, right? right. And then, okay, in that same county... My boss, about 15 years ago, maybe even closer to 16, 17 now, they had a, a, a stray dog on that property. They had, it's like a thousand acres. Of, uh, it was a big uh, deer lease. 
And uh, they said that dog was on their land for several years, just roaming around, man. And then one time they came up, and that dog was missing a leg. You know, that it was completely ripped out of a socket. It was a big old hole yeah. in, the, in the shoulder. And that's kind of what that picture reminded me of, you know. You know, that's that has an interesting correlation to something that I was information I was given last year and this is from one of my one of my inside sources they said uh, when they had the special forces teams that were were sent out after these things to eliminate them when they started acting badly um, one of the prime instructions was to never get within arm's reach of one of these things uh, and apparently they learned the hard way by uh, I don't know how many times this happened but soldiers having their arms ripped out of their sockets yeah so but something with this kind of thing Jans is the one that talks about that all the damn time (laughs) sure and i but it's an interesting i mean it's not it's not we just see it in this picture we don't hear about it in other stories it's it's sort of a recurring theme and again that's probably not predatory behavior but it's sort of linked to that in a way you know what i mean because anything that's going to be you know, sort of in that mode as being a predator and and an apex predator more than likely, you know, and if they have a short temper, which these things have demonstrated time and again, they do have a short temper, uh, that might be the kind of thing they would do. Yeah, and I asked my boss about that dog uh, because they didn't know if it was coyotes or hogs that got a hold of it. And they said it had no other markings on it. Like it wasn't like in a fight or anything. It was like that. It was just tore off. Yeah, they well, wouldn't tore off. animals wouldn't it, they would also be like chewing because they're trying to keep on try they're trying to keep on grabbing it, right? So wouldn't they keep on be like gnaw marks and stuff? Yeah. Uh, on the the, uh, the animal the dog say? Yeah, or on the on the goat, you know. Well, you know, yeah. If you're if you're talking about a cat or, or a coyote or something right. like that, sure, you're, you're going to see markings all over the animal, not just what we see in the picture. So that that yeah, that's really. I I think that <laughs> he was really pissed off or something. <laughs> I I mean, you I'm sure you could probably find videos on YouTube where you know of mountain lions and other animals like that killing and and eating i mean we've all seen stuff on national geographic yeah yeah africa and elsewhere of animals you know tight alliance and stuff killing animals and it's nothing like what you see in this picture yeah yeah even in in a in a clean kill you can still see claw marks and, and other bite marks you know right and there isn't any of that in this picture it's it's a fairly clean carcass other than that really big area <laughs> that's removed. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's ripped from the skin. I mean, the whole flesh, everything from the ribs. That's right. I mean, the strength of that and just the it's just bizarre. I mean, it's yeah, like what if if you think about in terms of of the Sasquatch, you know, and a lot of people don't think they're real, but if you put yourself in that mode for a moment, think, okay, well, what if they are real? You know, something like that, If and if that's what caused that in the picture, uh, it sort of brings it to home about not only the strength, but where where the animal's mindset is and so on. Uh, and it's pretty sobering, you know, when you look at something like that and think, right, that could have been done by one of these things. Well, that was a live goat. I mean, it wasn't like decaying or anything. I mean, it was, I, everything was still intact and still... You know, it was alive and had strength, tinsel strength, whatever you want to call it. It wasn't decaying crap or some, like, you know, old guy can just rip it apart. It it would be more interesting, of course, if we had, you know, like some of our our forensic people to really examine a carcass like that to make a determination, you know, how the animal animal was killed, to to scan the whole body for any kind of other markings, you know, to rule out. What, right. what or or to rule in what may have done it you know yeah uh, is you know you, you theorize that well maybe it was a cougar okay what does a cougar, what kind of a markings do a coo- does a cougar leave there's going to be claw marks in the carcass if nothing else to hold the animal down and usually they go for the throat first to suffocate the animal throat of the body right. uh, so Of course, it's one of those things, you know, we have to definitely keep in mind for down the road. You know, we need people, you know, when they go out on something that to to really do a a little more thorough investigation of the carcass so we can maybe make a little better determination. But just looking at that picture, uh, it's it's very unusual. 
Yeah, well, totally. And that's that's what caught my attention. It was just that's not normal predatory behavior for a mountain lion. It's just not. That there no, you're more, right. Or there would have been more eaten, uh, and it wouldn't have been out in the open. It would have been, you know, off in the brush. You know. Yeah. Now it's clear. It's clear the animal is dragged from. You know, you can see kind of a, an area with trees in the background and some smaller brush, but it was dragged from that location out into the middle of this open pasture, and, and that's very odd. I kind of wondered about that. Well, and, and being so close to the house, I'm wondering if. Uh, you know, her driving up didn't chase whatever had killed this goat, chased it off. But being that close to the house, and to me, that's just something's trying to make a statement. And I can't see and, and you being know, doing Here, Here's a thought, too. Let me throw this at you guys and see what you think. What if it wasn't an adult Sasquatch? Let's say, let's just say for, you know, sake mm. of conversation. That sounds, yeah. an, adult Sasqu- an adult Sasquatch would probably carry the animal off some distance. And probably eat the whole so thing. So you're thinking a juvenile like I was. But but what if it was a juvenile? Yeah. First of all, you know, it drags the animal, which a, an adult probably wouldn't do. It probably just carry it around. Although it's not out of the question. They wouldn't drag it. Uh, I mean, there, there's a number of scenarios. But what if it was a juvenile, you know, out making its kills? And it drags the animal out into the open and... And decides to start eating it. Maybe she drove up and spooked it off. Maybe. What are, What are you guys' thoughts about that? That's That's a distinct possibility. Yeah, to me that actually makes a lot more sense than anything else. Because I don't think a, uh, I, I think a mountain lion would have carried it off, and I think if uh, uh, an adult squatch would have just carried it off too, and it, or a juvenile probably it scares it a bit easier. Or you're just playing yeah, so with it. Either way, yeah, I, yeah. I like that. I, to me, that's that's plausible. You know, I mean, I do, and yeah, I can deal with that. Well, you know, it's one of those things. That, yeah, I look at a picture and I'll say to myself, "Why? Why is it out in the open? Knowing any, how how wild animals work, you have to ask the question: Why did it drag it from a re, a reasonably protected location out into the open? That doesn't make a lot of sense in the first place, and uh rule if we can rule out things like mountain lion or or and you don't have a lot of choices of animals in that area um if it were wild pigs the whole the whole goat would have been eaten um so I, i'm not sure what else there is but um those things don't seem to apply they don't add up to this so then you have right. to ask okay if what if it was a sasquatch well if it's an adult it's not just going to leave it there most likely uh, but a younger juvenile with less experience might very well do this. Not having the knowledge or maybe the uh, uh, the survival wit, you know, to drag it off and into a hidden location. Right. Kind of like if it was a toddler of the adolescent juvenile thing. You know, maybe it was playing with it and it, <laughs> and it whoops. I don't know. It just Well, they. I'm sure they teach them to hunt when they're fairly young. So yeah. It could very. It could have been a very. It could have been a very young one. Um, you know, maybe it's his first kill. We don't know. I mean, again, it's all speculation, of course. Of course, and it, to me, that works. I mean, I don't see any. I don't see. After watching, I would consider myself a National Geographic expert. But I mean, after seeing everything from alligators to whales eating everything, I've never seen anything like that on TV. And, and that was the point I was making right, before. Right, right. You know, we, we've all, well, well, most of us have seen things in National Geographic, and, and if you don't, you can go on YouTube and watch all these videos about, you know, different predatory animals eating, you know, capturing prey and eating. And this this looks more like something you'd see out of, uh, you know, the cattle mutilation pictures <laughs> than, uh, than uh, you know, a, a, prey, well, a, a predatory animal right. attack. Well, it looks... Um, for, I mean, it looks bizarrely clean. I mean, there is no it is. It, the the fur, the 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 wool on it, the whatever you want to call it, the hair. I don't know. Yeah, you know, it's not blood soaked or nothing. Not really. There's a couple of spots on the back, but that was probably from dragging it. Yeah. Um, and again, we don't know because we don't see the other side of right. the animal. That's but, true uh, too. But you know, I'm just saying from what I I'm looking at, that's. You know, I, I mean, I see more dead blood in when I was in Iraq than on that thing. 
Yeah. 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 Well, you know, of course, the, the woman wanted to go out and follow the blood trail, uh, the smear mark. And well, see, that's what I would have done. <laughs> uh, well, I told her, I said, are you by yourself? And she said, well, yeah. And I said, then don't go do it. Yeah. Uh, I don't want you running into something that that uh, could potentially harm you. Uh, but uh, I hadn't heard back from her yet. But I told her, I said, wait till your husband gets home and then both y'all go out there. Now, did she take this picture, or did you take the picture? No, no, she took the picture. Okay. And she, did she take any other pictures? Uh, no, just that one. And that you know, and, and this is how I come about it. Um, childhood friend of mine, uh, who I still stay you know fairly well in touch with, uh, uh, she had uh, posted it on hers, asking opinions on her Facebook page, asking opinions, and. Um, and she's married to a, a, a former Leo in uh, in South Texas. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I told her, I said, you know, gosh, Carrie, that just kind of, to me, looks like it's a, a definite, uh, some kind of apex predator, but it doesn't, to me, does not look like a big cat. You know, just doesn't look like what a, a mountain lion would do. Not even what a bobcat would do. It's certainly pretty unusual, and, and again, you know, cats almost always, when they kill, they go after the throat to close off the air supply, and and when you look at the picture, I don't see any marks on the throat I don't of the animal. I don't yeah, see, been... I see a little bit of blood on the back, but that's it. That's it. Yeah. yeah you, you would see on the underside of the throat where the windpipe is, that's where where cats go for. Um, and, and you don't really see that in the picture, no evidence anyway of it. Yeah, exactly. So... So you have to wonder, how did the animal die in the first place? I mean, was the neck broken? And we've seen, we've seen pictures. Um, well, there's two ways I, I, lions will, will kill. Just like you said, underside of the throat and close off the windpipe. The other way is on the back of the neck where they bite hard enough to separate the vertebrae in the, in the spinal column. And uh, one of the canines will lacerate the spinal cord itself. But we don't even yeah, see but that. Sure. But again, you don't see any marks on the back of the neck. He's, exactly. So I mean, the head the head is black, and the rest of the animal is white. Um, and fairly well. So it's pretty it's it's pretty easy to see any markings, and, and it looks pretty clean. The hair. Yeah, you know, that one little blood spot on the back, and that's about it. Yeah, that's just about it. There's not much else on the carcass. <sighs> so you know, it it to me it's. It, to me, it's one of two things. It could very well be a mountain lion, but if it is a mountain lion, it's probably injured, right? And is having a hard time eating, which is not unusual. Sometimes they do break their canines off. Right, uh, it is possible. The other thing is, is it's a Sasquatch, and it's it's either a juvenile that didn't know what the hell it was doing. Or it's an adult making a statement saying, I want you out of the area. And that would explain why it's in the position where it is. Exactly. How, how far is yeah. the, the goat from the house? 300 yards. Is that facing the head or going away? No, facing the, the pitch? head. Wow. Yeah, look, it looks like you can see the back of the goat is facing the tree line back right. there. So. Now, do we know, is there any sort of a history in that area of any Bigfoot activity? Just what me and you've researched, and that's just been kind of sparse. Okay. You know, we had, but it's not, but it's not out of the wrote question. Wrote that, uh, I guess, that letter that said that, uh, that talked about the, about the, the Bigfoot in, uh, in the Bandera area that they had killed. That male, uh, that female, and in, in juvenile. Oh, okay, right, right. Uh, but we couldn't get any uh, verification on that. And that's something listeners might, you know, uh, realize too that those areas where you might think there aren't these things, we find that there are. So it's, all, most areas aren't out of the question as far as uh, these things being present there. Well, you know, and, so I, and this all comes oh, into my, my point about, uh, you know, 
predatory behavior with Sasquatches and and how they they tend to react towards uh, uh, if we're aggressive towards them, then they're definitely going to get aggressive right back. Uh, right. That's that would be a front, and and we know that especially from when they do oftentimes these challenges. Exactly. Uh, but in the same token, it's it's hard to ignore. And don't get me wrong, I I I don't like, or I, I shouldn't say I don't like, I don't. I don't favor the author of Missing 911, but the guy did do a, a fairly decent job of presenting, not openly but covertly pre, uh, presenting, uh, a pretty veiled case for missing people in some of these areas that, uh, you know, like national parks. Yeah, that, I'm researching that kind of stuff. And, and that, uh, to me, that, that speaks volumes about, you know, these people just mysteriously end up disappearing. And it's one of the things he doesn't realize is the numbers are actually much larger than anyone, including him, realizes. Um, and, and I know that from my sources. Um, and I won't say who they are, but you guys know because we've talked. Um, it's actually it's a pretty scary thing when you look at that. And that's all, that's all very much predatory behavior. And then, of course... Um, you know, we know about them. Many, many, many people have seen these things. And what really grabbed my attention years ago was uh, some of the stories. And I saw this as a recurring theme throughout Hi. any of the books written on Bigfoot was people saying, oh, you know, so-and-so, this person was out hunting and they were getting ready to take a shot at a deer or elk or some other animal. And then the Sasquatch comes out of the woods, grabs the animal and runs off with it. Well, it's not there to protect the animal. It's, it's, it's bagging its own meal. Well, go. yeah. Well, well, and there's that there's that story in East Texas that I read several years ago, in the Sabine uh, River Basin area, over by Toledo Bend, where a hunter had actually shot uh, a deer, got out of his tree stand, went to go retrieve the deer, and a Sasquatch jumped out of the damn wood line, grabbed the deer, and started running with it. Uh, yeah, you know, and, and Joe can verify this. Uh, you know, the hunters in East Texas get real, real pissy about somebody taking their kill. So, yeah. you know, uh, Forrest Gump there decided he was going to chase after the damn thing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he was running and well, <laughs> they turned around and started growling at him. Well, it started growling at him. Yeah, it, 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 it took a very defensive, very aggressive posture with him. And he's like, you know what? Of course, this this creature was gray in color. Uh, right. he, at that point, he said, "Okay, you can have it. I, I ain't gonna fight you over it." <laughs> <laughs> Wise choice. <laughs> well, yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's it's funny to me that somebody would even think to chase it, but I guess, you know, everybody reacts differently. Um, you know, if you're hunting and you know something grabs your deer, you might be ticked off and and want to go get it, you know, instinctually and not really thinking, then your brain catches up and you say, crap, what am I doing? Yeah, I'd done that. And when I was in Panama, I did that with an anaconda. We, our Jeep jumped. <laughs> or there was a anaconda was stretched out across the road, so we jumped it with the Jeep. We thought it was just a log, mm -hmm. so we just rode over it. Well, it moved, and we, we were drunk because we just came from Cologne. So we were driving into town or coming back from town, and... It, it ran off into the woods or crawled or whatever snakes mm -hmm. do, so they did it. <laughs> and, and we were hey, let's go grab it. Well, we just jumped it with a Jeep. It didn't phase it at all. And four little skinny GIs are going after a, a anaconda, which, yeah, was was not cool. So well, you know, I, I, know I totally that. understand that. Hello? Any, any uh, predatory stuff going on in your neck of the woods there? Ooh, me? Uh, yeah. Uh, oh. <laughs> not that I uh, know of right offhand. You know, I mean, like he was saying, man, uh, uh, there's tons of stories of stuff like that happening. I mean, you know, people killing hogs and, uh, oh, you know, people. You know, and, and so, what's interesting, you know, I was it just made me think, uh, you made me think um, that, Jack, you were talking about somebody who had dogs missing as well. 
and, and you had asked me if I thought that might have been Bigfoot related. And, and a lot of people don't understand that, uh, you know, humans, we have our pets. If these things want an easy meal, that's the place to come to. It's not they're going to run for the hills from the hills from us. If they think there's an easy meal to be had, that'll, they'll come in and take them. And uh, I know you know of a couple of these situations where dogs have been killed or just taken. Yeah, yeah. A friend of mine who's a professor, he asked pulled me aside and asked me about it. And he's got a friend that lives outside of uh, Gunnison, Colorado. <clears throat> ah, yeah. And, uh, excuse me. Anyways, he's got, uh, he's got German short hairs. And he had, apparently, uh, just a... He's like the, you know, like the crazy cat lady that's got a billion cats. Well, this is crazy, crazy <laughs> dog guy. Got a billion dogs. Uh, well, you know, and they're all his pets, you know, he, he hunts with them, but he doesn't, he's not like this big field trailer or, or, uh, you know, a, a big time dog shower. He just, he has a bunch of dogs and they're all his pets and, uh, but they've been coming up missing one right after another, you know, and it's almost on a nightly basis. And he, now he's had quite a few missing already. Yeah. Yeah. He? Several. And, um, and that's the one thing he asked me, he said, uh, he said, "You know, T.W., I, I, I don't, uh, I don't really prescribe to the the whole point of, of, uh, you know, Bigfoot. But he said, there's no other signs that would, that lead to any other, you know, rational conclusion, because these dogs aren't raising a ruckus in the middle of the night. He gets up, you know, he feeds his dogs at night, uh, turns around, uh, next morning gets up, and one's missing." You know, I, I think it's worth mentioning or having you mention uh, a little background on this particular professor uh, because he didn't believe in these things at all just a few months ago, correct? No, uh, no. It's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm taking... So tell us about how that unfolded. It's kind of interesting. Well, you know, I'm, I'm taking some classes at uh, local university and, and, uh, one of the classes I took was a, a more of a seminar class. We basically we would dissect uh, different research papers, and uh, granted, we only met once a week, and it was only one credit hour, but uh, it was a lot of fun. And uh, some of the students were doing, you know, the 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 big chief bleeding heart tree hugger papers. You know, like, you know, what are we going to do about the humpback chub? They can't. They can't proliferate by themselves. They need human intervention to to uh, to stay, uh, you know, a non-extinct species. Uh, we did one about, uh, you know, kind of along the same lines as Jurassic Park, only bringing back like the thylacine and uh, right. the dodo bird, um, and uh, you know, of course, I I had my issues with both of those papers. Um, and, and what, uh, most of it deals with, you know, the fiduciary aspect of it, you know, <clears throat> we could, we could spend a dollar to save a nickel, but that don't mean that we should. Uh, and the other one is, is that, you know, uh, we go through the extent of, yeah, we could pull DNA from, uh, you know, uh, specimens, harvestable specimens that have been preserved for a hundred plus years uh, or more and uh, but why? Why would we go to that right. extent? Because we may end up bringing back something we don't want like a disease true, true. Um, and a genetic disease not, a, not something that is uh, so much transmittable by uh, airborne, but transmittable by touch or, or, you know, wipe out our poultry industry or, uh, wipe out our, uh, other marsupial, uh, specimens that we have that are still very viable and, and doing well. Well, sure. So how, how did you get on the topic of big, well, family? you know, I, I got tired of the, uh, the tree hugging papers that we were doing. And I said, you know, uh, I pulled him aside and I said, hey, look, you, uh, you mind if I do one about uh, about Bigfoot? And he kind of smiled. And I said, you know, it's, kind of, <laughs> it's, it's tongue in cheek. 
but but there's some there's some beliefs that I have that that maybe need to be presented and let's let's go from that aspect. So yeah, you know, I contacted you and I got uh, I got the Minnesota Iceman story, and and we both know that there's problems with that story as it is, anyways. Uh, but you know, I went through Argosy Magazine, which is no longer in print, but mm-hmm. but Argosy brought us like uh, John Carter of Mars, Tarzan. It, it was more of a Pulp Fiction magazine than it was a you know like Nature, which is a you know sure cutting edge scientific magazine but but a lot of the stuff that they had brought up back then we now have realized like cell phones uh where they actually mm-hmm. talked about that stuff and it was uh semi science fiction to uh science reality so uh, there was an article in Argosy magazine about the Minnesota Iceman and I presented that in class well yeah I got raked, raked over the coals on that one and uh, there was one kid in there, God love him, Quentin. He's a good kid, a smart kid. Uh, but uh, some of the problem is, is that he's only in his early 20s, and he's wrapped so damn tight. Uh, you know, I, I told him, dude, you got to loosen up. No wonder you can't get a date. So, <laughs> you know, him and his, and his two cohorts just, you know, really got, they got, I mean, overtly angry about this paper. We can't believe you brought this to our attention. I'm like, come on now, there's actual scientists uh, and and me and you kind of feel the same, same thing about Jeff Meldrum, but but he's actually a few but scientists. There's, but there's been, a few, there's been a few scientists. Well, you know, uh, uh, Grover Krantz is one of them, but, but they're the only ones that are really kind of bringing this to the forefront and giving it any traction or any validity where they actually study like the Patterson film, uh, they study morphology of footprints, how the tracks are laid out, uh, where they're actually doing bona fide work to try to prove the existence of Bigfoot in the scientific field. Where we're not so much, not that we're not scientists, but we're, uh, it's hard for us to get any traction in, in, in the scientific realm because the, the first thing they do is, well, you don't have a PhD. Right. Well, you know what? This, I don't. But, I don't need a PhD to be a post hole digger. I've done that for twenty plus years of my life. But you were able to sway this professor, this college professor's opinion. Yeah, actually, I did. Uh, after you said several. And pictures. how'd you do that? <laughs> well, he his argument was that if the Sasquatch was real, how come there have been no juvenile footprints exactly. found? And I think I sent you about a dozen pictures yeah. of different juvenile footprints. And the, <laughs> the footprint, the, the casting of that one footprint of that juvenile that was on the other side of that lake. Uh, right. And, you know, one of the kids had said, well, apparently somebody was on the other side of that lake because they, they had a child over there. I'm like, dude, I mean, how old are you? You know, I'm 21. I said, okay, would you let one of your nieces and nephews walk in almost freezing mud barefoot and he said well what do you mean i said well apparently when this was taken was in april time frame this is in the northern part of washington state where it was still pretty bitter cold and nobody there's no public access to the other side of the lake no there isn't so i I, i'm very familiar with that area myself you know my my question to you is how do you explain you know, adult human footprints that measure upwards around 18 inches, followed by little itty bitty footprints that measured less than five inches, and they they were they were yeah. footprints. They weren't they weren't shoe prints. They were footprints. Right. That that particular line of tracks was right near the water, and it's very soft mud. Um, a friend of mine and his wife found those prints, and very close to them no more than maybe a dozen feet away were uh, a line of 15 inch Sasquatch footprints. So, you know, number one, there is no toddler and, and the size of that foot would make it a human infant. So no human infant that size is going to be walking, let alone in mud alongside of the backside of a lake in a remote area. And especially that close to an adult Sasquatch track. Oh, exactly. So, 
you know, you can sort of add two and two and come up with a reasonable conclusion in that situation. Exactly. But we do have lots of juvenile footprints and things. So it was. it's interesting that it's not really that difficult most of the time when we have uh, somebody in the academic community who has raises a question like that uh, to address that question directly. Well, yeah, and and of course, this this doctor, one of his best friends, is actually dating Renee from Never Finding Bigfoot. Um, <laughs> and uh, he, matter of fact, he went and spent uh, several weeks with the guy because uh, he's a he's a uh, this professor is a fish guy. You know, he does mm-hmm. uh, he does uh, uh, salmonid research. You know, trout. Uh, did a big study on cutthroat trout that are in uh, the state of New Mexico. Um, had done a, a baseline study about what uh, what genetics each different lake had, and and he proved that uh, salmonids are not necessarily uh, monogamous to the species. Uh, Browns will breed with rainbows. Rainbows will breed with cutthroat. Mm-hmm. Cutthroat will breed with uh, uh, other cutthroat from other areas. And uh, the cutthroat that they had in Yellowstone had been shipped into the state of New Mexico several years ago to try to boost the cutthroat trout population in the state of New Mexico. Well, they only found two lakes that had 100% DNA match to the lower Rio Grande Valley cutthroat trout. The rest of them were like 50-50 to 75-25 of other species of cutthroat trout. And the state of New Mexico, uh, Game and Fish, had decided, well, if they're not 100%, we need to destroy them. And my, my point, and his point as well, is why? That's that's right. silly. That's stupid. You're cutting your nose off to spite your face. So let's 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 go back to him and his missing dog. So he he started the first thing that came to his mind was Bigfoot, or did he think that something else? Well, was he wanted to know. He wanted to hear my take on it, and and I said, well, I mean, here's my thing with if it was a mountain lion that was taking these dogs, they would have had all kinds of problems. Uh, now, weren't the dogs in some kind of an enclosure? Yeah, they're in the you know a, a fenced-in backyard, uh, and I said you would have heard all kinds of barking and uh, commotion here going on. Uh, you know, dogs are not quiet when you know big cats are around. They they'll raise hell, right. especially in a pack setting. Uh, exactly where there's a group. Yeah, of them there. and and. The, Apparently, his buddy hadn't been hearing any of this. And I said, well, my question to you would be, uh, and to him, you know, how easy access is it to his backyard? And he said, well, he said, I've been in his backyard. I can tell you that right now. He said, it's it's not easy access. You know, you have to actually turn a, a latch to get into the backyard. Did he say what kind of a fence he has and how tall? It's like it? a six-foot privacy fence. Okay, so it's a wooden yeah. fence. So, uh, to me, that's... And if a cat were getting in, you would see claw marks on the wood. Exactly. Or you would see you'd see some kind of commotion in the backyard, prints in the backyard. Uh, right. some... And there'd be blood, there'd be something where the animal, the dog was killed or, or at least attacked. Exactly. Uh, and in a pack setting, I, you know, and it's like I told him, I said, you know as well as I do. I don't think in a pack setting, a mountain lion would risk getting hurt like that um that's that sort of makes me think about milo do you remember back when we were still in school uh when our uh our, our former uh person we won't name had all the rabbits right. the rabbit yeah i remember that house. you remember yeah. that what a mess that was they came right in and this was anybody familiar with the town of roy in washington uh even to this day is actually a very little town there's not much there there's probably more people there now than there ever used to be yeah uh it's a, it's a place you drive through and if you blink twice you miss the town it doesn't even have stop signs uh, and it has signs that say whoa you're right so they were they lived back in the 70s it was relatively close to 
uh, I guess, open areas where you, there were trees and things. So, you know, definitely something could have approached from that way. But he used to tell us there was stuff going on. We didn't really believe it. We, he, he exaggerated a lot of things. But we went out there one time. They said the rabbits were tore up. And sure enough, we went to the back of the house where the rabbit cages were. Now, the rabbit cages were built very sturdily. They were attached to the house. It's a sort of a, it was sort of a U-shaped uh, where they were set back in against the house in a very protected position. And uh, they were probably the heaviest wire mesh made for cages like that. Uh, the framework was two by sixes, very heavily constructed, a lot of times double two by sixes, uh, all the framework. And they were positioned about two feet off the ground and then there, where their pellets would drop down below. Uh, all almost well all the rabbits were killed they were a few in cages had been scared to death the rest were missing uh cages torn open from the underside and you could see big holes had been poked through the mesh uh that were probably a couple inches across almost and and you if you would imagine like a big hand reached up through on the corner of one of these grasped the, uh, the mesh and crushed it and then opened that thing like like you'd open a tin can it, it ripped this heavy mesh along the seams. Uh, you know, one, one going to the north, one going to the east. Ripped it open. And I, I remember his mom said, well, it had to be dogs. Well, a dog would have to get on its back, crawl under there, and, you know, dogs scratch, you know, and bite. There was no evidence of anything like that. This was grasped, like, by a hand and pulled open. So for these things to come in and take domestic animals is absolutely within reason we, we've heard these kinds of things and, and milo and i have seen this you know time and again so in terms of predatory you know getting back to that predatory behavior uh, and these are just domestic animals we're talking about like this picture we, we spent a half an hour talking about you know all these goats and and the key thing that's interesting is when you said they were in trees uh now granted a cat might take something up in a tree to eat it but when they, they found multiple goats in trees is that right yeah and that's not the only time I've heard a story like that. There are other stories, not just of goats, but of hunters who were reportedly killed by Sasquatches and hung in trees. Uh, we've got somebody, our, uh, one of our other regional directors is actually working on tracking down uh, a particular story that involves that right now. So uh, very interesting stuff. I mean, we're, we've got about three minutes left, so fellas... Milo, Joe, you guys have anything you want to uh, bring up? Anything about your your own areas or? Um, I'm going, what's going out. On what you guys are doing? Yeah, I'm going out next week after uh, a birthday party, and I'm going to go out for like ten days and go up towards Mount Baker and Arrington, Darlington. Oh, yeah, so I'm going out there. Have you have you had a chance to get in touch with our people up there? You know, I sent emails and I have not got anything back. Okay, I, I'm going to send you. Uh, couple of phone numbers okay and uh, you should be able to get in touch with them but uh but since we have since we have people up that way it'd be better you know because they're familiar with the country yeah i'm i'm cool how about you joe you know we just got back from our little expedition and uh you know shane came down from dallas area and uh, we had a pretty good time i think we got some pretty good results you know and i'm still going through a bunch of audio yeah, you, you know you, yeah, you sent the audio of uh, of the wood knocks. I was never a big proponent of wood knocks. I think mostly because of that silly television <laughs> show. But when you hear things like what's on your audio and Milo, what, the audio that Brandy right, has, yeah. you know, those to me are are much more what I would think that something like this would do out in the forest. If they were going to do anything like that, these are the kinds of things I would expect. Right. You know, not some silly interaction with a group of people using disco lights and all kinds of crazy screaming and stuff. But if they were going to make any sort of uh, communication between one another about maybe your presence or right. your presence in an area, uh, that's what I would expect. Well, so when I when I hear those audios, I think that's that's yeah. really. I should be getting the the Fleur camera. I already got half of it now. Um, okay. so I get the Fleur camera probably sometime next week. I just, okay. so I'm, I'm almost done paying for it. Oh, good deal. Good deal. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and for anybody listening, um, you can go on my website, williamjevening.com 
and when you place your cursor over the research teams when you when you scroll down the main page you're going to see some items at the top like the shop and and things like that you'll see research teams place your cursor over the research teams and you're going to get a drop down menu and uh, you can get a hold of our regional directors there and, and a number of the other people uh, in the Jebding Research Group. If, if you've had an encounter or if you want to become part of one of the teams or start your own team, get a hold of Joe or Milo or uh, Jay or uh, Jeremiah, depending on which part of the country you're in, or get a hold of any of the guys, any of the guys you want to get a hold of. You know, their emails are there. Get in touch with them. Uh, and it really doesn't matter like I have uh, a guy in uh, Oklahoma, uh, he doesn't have a lot of time, he works a lot, but he, he likes to do, um, you know, go to the field at least a couple times a year, and that's fine. It, or even if you're not able to go to the field, if you're able to and want to help in any other capacity, by all means, get a hold of us. We can use people from any walk of life. Uh, any sort of help is definitely appreciated. So get in touch with us, or if you have an encounter, uh, you can talk to one of the regionals, or if you want to get a hold of me directly, my personal email is williamjevning at yahoo.com. Get a hold of me, and uh, we'll talk about your encounter. One of the things that JRDG does is guarantee your privacy. Uh, if you don't want people to know who you are or where things happen, we guarantee that <laughs> will not happen. So. Thanks, fellas. We better wrap it up for this week. Yeah, well, whatever you do, uh, folks, don't get a hold of that putz, T.W. Young's. He'll just t- duct tape you <laughs> to a tree out in the woods and start wood knocking. <laughs> That's right. And, and we know I just got an email from Jeremiah, so uh, he's a little late on the draw today. So I, I know you're uh, you're already working on something for him for his uh, uh, Shagamaya mem that he put on Facebook. So, <laughs> All right, fellas. Well, thanks for the chat today, and uh, everyone keep in, keep in touch. Uh, check us out on Facebook. It's a JRG Bigfoot Research Group, and uh, we're always looking for new members. It's a, a little more credible place. You know, we don't allow Looney Tunes on there, so sometimes you might see a, a crazy post on there, and it gets deleted because we don't tolerate nonsense. Uh, yeah, we don't about. mind open chatting, open discussion, but and it's not joking. Now, the joking aside, we do joke. But but some of the crazy train stuff, I mean, like, you know, interdimensional Sasquatch or their, you know, their forest friends or all that kind of hooey, you know, we don't. Or implanted, to implanted that, so. seeds from one species to the other. <laughs> yeah, right. That's cool. Mind speaking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one, that one's a good one, too. Mind speaking. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you me to run like hell and I did. <laughs> Hey, Will, so are we doing this like every – are we going to have a set schedule for all this kind of stuff? Oh, for us oh to- hold on. We'll, we'll uh, chat about it after. Let me stop this. And uh, uh, So anyway, every, yeah, we, what we're going to do, uh, I'll let everybody know who's listening. Um, this show is our free show, of course. And in about a month, I'm going to be posting a premium podcast that's almost all – what's termed a class a bigfoot encounters witnesses uh my one-on-one interview with witnesses so that's what that show's about it's it's five dollars a month uh for a weekly show it's the price of a cup of coffee for a whole month's worth of our show so uh that show's called witness of the unknown so be watching for that uh as far as this show goes i what i like to do is on a monthly rotational basis uh, one of the weeks we do a show like this where we have a roundtable panel. We talk about a subject or various subjects. You know, we don't have to stay on the topic we start with. Uh, we can wander around sort of like we did today and, and talk about different things. Uh, I like to have one of the shows with a witness. Um, another one of the shows will be, like, let's say, I, I, now I do want to talk with Joe. And Joe, I think we, we've already talked about doing that for next week. Yeah. In fact, for those listening, if you want to hear about what's going on in Texas, uh, Joe, our regional director, and his one of his teams went out just last week, and we're going to talk about Joe, his organization, what you guys are doing, and, and sort of focus on uh, your team. And that's what I want to do once a month is to, uh, like with Milo, we'll do your, your, you and your team 
one of the shows, and we'll do that so that everybody kind of gets a feel for who we are at the Jevening Research Group. What we'll do uh, with the, and, you know, Tales from the Unmentionables. What, what was that? It'll be Tales from the Unmentionable, you know, the, the Night of right, Terror right. of Shagamaya. Oh, well, you sure. <laughs> but I, I try. I want to try to do something a little bit different each week, but on a monthly schedule. In other words, we'll have four similar kinds of shows. That the, the platform will be the same from month to month, but it'll be like different teams, different stories, things like that. So uh, that's that's what everybody can expect to uh, get from us here. Cool. All right, fellas, I'm going to close this out tonight. Everyone, thanks for joining. Uh, join us again next week for... Uh, Hopefully we'll have, I actually I do have an encounter uh, with a witness we can discuss next week. So, or no, no, sorry, the week after. Joe, we're doing your team next week and the week after I have scheduled a witness. So thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we'll see you again next week. Okay.